So it has been a trying week, I'll tell you that. We started on Sunday with the loss of a, of a good friend and, uh, and, and someone that we love dearly. And so we, we mourned and celebrated their life. Um, I wasn't able to be at the funeral on Thursday, but I heard it was a beautiful celebration of life. And, uh, and so from, month, from Sunday until even just yesterday, it has been just one of those weeks. You know what I'm saying? It's like, but anytime you feel like, it's, like I won't let my kids feel that way. Like my, my son, my oldest son was, we we're talking and he hadn't seen his friends in several days and things that he wanted to do, he couldn't do and it was kind of going sideways. And he was like, oh, it's just my luck. I said, don't ever say that again. Don't, don't ever say that again. Because that, that's, not, that's not what God would speak over you. That's the enemy. The enemy tricks us into believing there's, this, there's luck and there's, that, that's not true. God is on your side, so you always got good luck, right? That's, God is on your side. That's just it. He's for you, not against you. So the mindset of, you know, he, he was like, it's just, just my life. I was like, let me tell you something. You've always, someone's always got it worse than you. Somebody's always got it better. If you always look at who's got it better, then you're going to be miserable. Celebrate what God has done in your life. And so right then when I was sick with COVID and COVID positive and he's, and we're, he's in my doorway and I'm preaching at him, I was like, okay, I'll be ready for Sunday. But I'm like, I refuse to allow that kind of language and those kind of ideas to sink in to my own house. But I would tell you the same thing. Recognize the enemy in your life. Recognize the things that he tries to speak over you. And, then, and don't allow it. Don't allow it in your home. Don't allow it out of your own mouth. Okay, Christians... As I talked to this family, I was talking to this mother and this sister, and we were talking outside the home, and, and they were both like, as, as much as we are, we're pained and we're upset, we know that, that our brother's with Jesus, my, my son's with Jesus this, today, that he's standing in the presence of God. And I thought, you know what, to be able to stand just, just a day after this great loss, this, this tra- to be able to stand and, and with such great faith and such great conviction, I thought, man, I better I better be able to stand with the same faith over my own family and whatever I'm going through. Amen? Amen. And so I expect that guy, I, I want you to just, that's not what I'm preaching about this morning. That's not even, that's just, that's a teaser. But I just want to encourage you this morning, don't allow the enemy, don't allow the, your, the words of your mouth to confess the things that are not from God. Yes. Okay, that's, that's the intro. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. This morning we'll talk about created for community. Created for community. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Mark chapter number 2. Mark chapter number 2. And when you get there, wave at me. A few of you are waving. Mark, some of you don't know where Mark's at. It's in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you. If you, don't have, if, if you, if you like that Bible and you like to take it home with you, go ahead and take it with you. Um, that's our gift to you today. If you're new with us, that's something that we do. We have someone very generous who, um, who, who provides them, and they want us to make sure that we give them away. And we've got a lot more in the back, and, and so we can, we can always fill that back up. Mark chapter number 2, verse number 1. Everybody should be able to find verse 1 pretty easy. If you don't have it in your Bible or, your, or your, you can find it, it should be on the screen behind. There it is. Look at that. These guys are amazing. These guys are amazing. I love them so much. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days after the news spread quickly that he was back home, soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors, sounds like Christmas time, that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, Four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to them, said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, Who is this saying? What is this saying? What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? 
So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out the door and walked through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed. And praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that is true, it is timeless, God, and it is just as applicable to our life today as the day that it was written. So Lord, today I pray that you would speak to us. God, allow the truth of your word to penetrate our hearts. Help us to understand who you are and who we are in Christ. Thank you for this clarity. God, today, not my words, but your words be spoken. We give you all the praise and all the honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Now, this story has got so many points, we're not going to preach all of them. I could. I could preach every point, but I'm not going to. Not today. We're just going to keep it simple. I'm not, you know, I hear sometimes I listen to pastors and they get halfway through their message and I'm like, this is too much. This is too much. I need to push pause. I need to just reflect on what they've already said. Like I can't, I can't just, uh, I can't even grasp all 45 minutes of their sermon. I need like 20 minutes. And then at the 20 minute mark, I'll push play again. And we'll, tomorrow I'll, I'll try to chew on the rest of what they're saying, right? So this, today I'm going to give you enough to chew with and walk away with today. We could talk about the man who was immediately healed that Jesus looked at him and said, get up, pick up your mat. Your sins are forgiven. Pick up your mat and go home. <laughs> And we could talk about that because that was amazing. Anybody ever seen that? Anybody ever seen anything like that happen before? No? Because I would be one of the onlookers who was stunned. Right? I'd be like, what? <laughs> wow. That's pretty dope. I'd love to see something like that. Anytime Jesus wants to use me to heal a lame person, I am so game. Because I can't wait to see someone just take up, you know, not a mat necessarily, but just get up and just walk. I, I'm, I'm in for that, right? We could talk about that. We could talk about the fact that while the Pharisees and the religious leaders are playing checkers, Jesus is playing chess. The religious leaders gathered around, listening to him teach because they were trying to trap him. Because everybody was coming to see Jesus. And they're like, what, what, who is this guy? What kind of authority does he have that people are packing? He's packing the house. They're looking for something wrong because that's what haters do, right? Haters love. They, they want to find what's wrong. And they don't look at the crowd and say, man, Jesus must be doing something good. They want to find out he must be doing something really kind of shady to get all this crowd coming around. The truth is that people were attracted to his authority and to the power that was inside of him. That's what people, and they're still attracted to that today. We can draw a crowd with, with pizza parties and youth, and we can draw a crowd with giving away free stuff. But the truth is people are still attracted to the power of God. And while Jesus was playing chess, these guys were playing checkers. And so Jesus didn't look at him immediately and say, pick up your mat and go. He said, your sins are forgiven because he was baiting the Pharisees. We could talk about that, but we're not going to. What I want to talk about this morning, I want to talk about the four men who gathered around a crippled man. Who gathered around a friend to make sure that he got his miracle. See, we're created for community. We're not created to do life alone. Sometimes it's easier, it's less messy, right? If we're going to be honest, it's less messy if we do life alone because we don't have to involve or include or bother anybody else. It's just me. I only have to worry about me and mine and what I got going on. But when we have life in community, it's not just about me anymore. You start to worry and think about others. You start to worry about their life and your prayer needs and your prayer requests when you go before God stops becoming all about you and it starts focusing on other people and other needs and that's when life gets messy. But the problem is you can't live your life alone. Long before this man was lowered on a mat through a roof, by the way, which is no, I mean, they dug a hole in someone's roof. That person was not a Second Amendment you know, person. Because I'm just going to tell you, if I'm at home and Jesus in my living room, and somebody starts like digging through the ceiling, we're getting the guns. I'm thinking burglar. You know what I'm saying? Everybody, you know, if you're welcome, you come through the door. If you're not welcome, you come through other places. So they would have been in a bad place if they was in the south and started lowering somewhere down. We'd be like, shh, shh, you know. And I digress. 
But, but, for, but these four guys, they dug a hole in someone else's roof, not worried about the consequences or what would happen, but they loved their friend enough that they knew the idea, the thoughts of who Jesus was. The rumors of Jesus had spread. They knew that he could create, that he could do miracles, and they knew that this was their opportunity. This is our moment, not for me, but for my friend, but for the, my friend who I have known since a kid has been paralyzed and sitting on a mat, begging for just the scraps, just to survive, and they said, it's not enough. It's not enough. Today is his day for a miracle. It wasn't based on his faith, because as a crippled person, they can't walk, much less climb on a roof and dig to the top. Nobody else around was worried, but their friend said, today is his day. We're going to make it happen. We get to the front door, and we can't get in. Like, that's, that's okay. We don't have to go through the front door. We'll go through a window. We can't get through a window. We'll go through a wall. We can't get close enough to the walls. You know what? I think we can get up there. <laughs> Every good story, <laughs> hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> I can imagine them leaning a, leaning a ladder and shimming him up. How do they get the, the crippled guy up on the roof? Just saying, those are, those are logistical questions we got to figure out. Because they had to get up there. I mean, it's anyway. They get up there and they dig the hole through the roof. Why? Because we're created for community. We're created to care about other people. All they were doing was what came natural to them. They weren't doing anything. And if you love somebody else then you, you know that what I'm talking about this morning. You know, you think it's, if, if it's your brother, your sister that needs the miracle and Jesus is the opportunity, then you know that there's nothing that could stop you. These people weren't, this, this wasn't their brother, this wasn't their family member, but he was part of their community. He was their friend. And they were tired of sitting and watching him sit on the side of the road and rot. Day after day after day. Begging for just enough to survive. Pe God's people weren't meant to, meant to survive like that. That's not the way that you were meant to live your life. You weren't meant to live your life on crumbs just enough to get by. That's, that's not the way God created you. That's not your purpose. God didn't create you to just survive, do enough to get by. He created you to thrive. He created you to be more than that. And the only way that we can be all that we can be is when we do it in the, in the idea and the context of community. But these four friends, they cared about somebody else other than themselves. And I think that's, that's the picture of church, right? To me, that's the picture of us. That, that's the picture that we should paint of one another. This past week, me and Tatum both were diagnosed or tested positive for COVID. I have a 15-year-old. I'm going to try very hard to say this as gently as possible. Because I love my children. And they're good. They're good kids. They're much better kids than I was when I was a teenager. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Like, seriously, they're, they're really good kids. I got a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old and a 4-year-old. And it was Tatum and I were both sick in the bed with the fever, chills, not feeling good, right? And I've got teenagers taking care of us. That's all, you, you see what I'm saying? But I want you to know that it wasn't just my teenagers taking care of us. There was, a, there was a plethora of phone calls and text messages and, 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 and people sending food to our house, thank God, because my son cannot cook. My 15-year-old cannot cook at all. Like, I'm talking about, like, pancakes, eggs, and he learned how to make quesadillas while we were in quarantine. So, we're, like, if, if it was just him, we'd have ate eggs and pancakes all week long. But we didn't. You know why? Because we had a, 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 a group of people around us who cared about us and who sent food and they sent, they sent love. They sent, you know what I'm saying? And, and they sent food. <laughs> they sent food. And groceries and all the things that we needed. And they kept calling and kept, all week long. And, and I know that we've, and we've done that for other people. And you've done that for other people. And we keep doing it. And I, and I thought to myself this morning, I thought, that's the point of community. Not just that we take care of each other in crisis, but that's one thing. 
That's one thing, not one thing that I know that when, when you're going through a hard time that I'm interested. You're not putting me out. You're not, you're not a bother to me. I hate when people call me and go, Pastor, I hate to bother you. You're not bothering me. You know why you're not bothering me? Because I love you. I don't mind you calling me. That's why I give away my cell phone number. If I wanted it kept secret, I wouldn't give it to you. I wouldn't print it on my business card. I don't mind you calling. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Within reason. <laughs> Within reason. If you call at 2 o'clock in the morning, somebody better be on fire or bleeding or stuck on the side. Like, there be a, it's been an emergency. Not, Pastor, I was thinking about Sunday. <laughs> That'll be the last time I answer your call at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's all I'm saying. I don't mind you're not bothering me. You never are. Because that's the idea of church, that it's more than just that it's more than just a group of people and hearing a motivational speech or, or, or a good talk <laughs> or scripture that you can read on your own. It's more than that. It's Because we were meant for community. This man received healing. This man received his miracle, oh, not because of him, but because he had four friends that had spent time together. They had prayed together. They had believed together. They knew that this was their moment for a miracle, and they weren't going to allow, they were going to allow nothing to stop them. That's what small groups are. People talk about, you know, they say Bible study, and, and I, I don't, Bible study is not like a bad word. It's not a bad thing, but it's more than a Bible study. Right? You can do a Bible study on your own. You can do a Bible study online. What changes it, what makes a difference in a small group and just a Bible study is that a small group comes together and you believe with one another. The, the, the great thing about small groups, when I talk to my wife, I talk to other small group leaders, and they're talking about their small group, is the connectivity that they start to feel. That you, you get to share more. Listen, if you come on Sunday and you sit here and then when it's over you leave as quickly as you came in. And, you, and then you go, I don't understand this idea of community. I don't get it. It's because you're not here. You're not going to get a sense of community on a Sunday morning in an hour and a half kind of service message deal. You're, it's not going to happen there. That's why we do small group. So that when people come in and they want to feel connected, they want something more. They need people to rally around them and believe for their life the miracles that God needs them to. Not just for themselves, but for their families and for their... Do you understand what I'm saying? Does it make sense? Like we're cre- that's, why God, that's why we do it. That's why we created for community. That's why we do small groups. Not because we want to fill your schedule with more stuff, events, services. Like I, 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 I'll be honest, like... I've got enough going on, right? Anybody else? No, just me. Perfect. I've got, I've got a million things going on. So do you. Outside of your job and your kids' activities and your activities and, and work <laughs> and just being at your house. Sometimes that's cool, right? Like, I, we're at my house. This is nice. We eat dinner here tonight. <laughs> Besides, outside of, I, I know how busy you are. I know how many things are, are pecking away and pulling at your time, but what I'm telling you, it's worth the investment. It's worth the investment that if you'll build and create community within this church, then as this church grows and people say, well, the church is just too big, that's, that's how we stay small as we grow large, is small groups. That as, we, as the church grows in numbers and in size, it's a way for you to continue to stay connected to each other, to us. Through small groups. We're going to launch them again in February. And, there is, there, and there's a lot of people in this church t- t- this morning that you haven't been a part of a small group. And you're like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. That's okay. We're going to give you a chance. Your chance is coming. And you're not too old. And you're not too young. You're not too this or too that. I mean, men, you can't join the women's small group. Think that goes without saying? That's why it's a women's small group. But you can't join the men's small group, right? There's a place for you to find community if you'll just do it. If you'll just do it. Because your miracle is waiting inside a community of believers who will love you and pray for you and, and, and lift you up, not just in the, good time, in the bad times, but in the good times. 
right? I want someone to celebrate with me when things are going right. I don't want just, you know, there are people who are good for crying, you know, they just, they're good criers, right? They cry really well. They mourn really well. Like when you're, it's a bad day, you're going through a bad time, they are good. And there are people who you know, have a hard time celebrating wins with you. Anybody know someone like that? You get, a good, you get something really good happen in your life, and they're like, oh, okay, those people are not your friends. <laughs> you just, those people aren't your friends. Get away from those people. But small groups should be filled with people who celebrate. You get a new car, and you drive it to your small group, and your small group should cheer. Woo! Man, that car is nice. I was telling this that we were, I, was at a, I was at an event one time, and this was years ago, and this lady pulls up, and she's got a, a brand new um, like Chevrolet GMC something. And when she pulled up, I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, your car, this car is beautiful. And she started trying to explain away what, you know, she's like, oh, I got it used. And I, and I was like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? And she's like, well, I just, I don't want you to think. I was like, stop. I was like, I'm happy for your blessing. I was like, I'm, I'm happy for your blessing. You don't owe me an explanation. You work hard, and you and your family are doing, the, are doing great, and God's blessing you. You don't, you don't owe me an explanation for this. You just say, yeah, God's blessing me. And let me celebrate with you. Why is it that we're afraid? Of, like, that doesn't even make sense to me. When you go on vacation, I was telling some other day, I was, I was looking at their vacation trips that they went on this past weekend. And they were, like, in the mountains, and they were camping, and they had a little camper out. I'm not camping in a tent, by the way. Like, just, nope. You want to camp in a tent? I'm not your guy. Talk to somebody else. And a camper, that sounds great. Sounds like a good time. But not a tent. Not a tent at all, ever, for any reason. Anyways. They're in the campers, and their family's all there. And, they're, and I, I told him, I said, man, I'm, I love your pictures. He's like, really? I was like, oh, man. I was like, my wife loves the camp, like, in camp tents. It's real. She's, I don't know. I don't get it. She's watching right now. I don't, I don't get it. I still don't. I just, whatever. <laughs> she was seven months pregnant with Caleb. And she's like, you know what I want to do this weekend? I was like, what? She's like, go camping. I was like, what? Why? There's a million things we could do. You want to go camping? We literally went camping, seven and a half months pregnant, started having Braxton Hicks <laughs> that night. It got like 40 degrees. It was, anyway, it's the whole thing. I celebrate with you. Right? Your, your small group, your community of believers, they're not just there to lift you up when you need your miracle. They're there to celebrate when life is at its very best and things are going good and God is blessing you. That should be a group of people that rally around you and say, yes, Lord, thank you for your answered prayers. Thank you for providing. Thank you for your blessings. That's what community is all about. People, we were created for community. That's what you and I d- desire. That's what when church is, when it feels hollow and it feels like it's not enough, it's because we're not, we haven't found community. I encourage you, as, as, this, as the band comes, we're going to close. I encourage you this week and the weeks to come. Maybe you're, 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 you're not, you haven't been a part of a small group in the past. We're going to launch them in February. But I want you to pray about it. Maybe you're, because there are several of you who are supposed to lead a small group. And you're like, what, me? I'm like, yep, that's you. You're supposed to lead one. And you haven't yet because you're afraid. You're like, well, I'm not sure. I don't know how, but we'll help you how. We'll give you the resources. We'll give you the training. We'll, we'll give you all that. We just need you to say, yes, I'm willing. I'm willing to be that, that conduit for community in my church. I'm willing to let God use me to dig through a roof to make sure somebody in our church gets their miracle. I'm willing because I know, like you know, that we're created for community. Let's all stand to our feet. As we worship today together, I, I, if, if there's any needs, we're not going to have you come up. I, I know that this at, during this season, it's January particularly, I don't, I'm not sure why, but it seems like there's lots of people who are sick. I know that we have lots of people out this morning who are sick, uh, who aren't feeling well, and so I want us to lift up those people. Um, our church isn't 1,000 yet. It's, it's not 1,500. It's not 2,000. It's, we haven't, we, we're not there yet. We're, we're small enough. We're in a great place that when you look around, you should see people that aren't here. You should notice them. I notice them every week, not because I'm like, where are they at? <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's not, that's not how my mind works. But I think, man, we're, I hope they're okay. I hope, I hope they're not sick. I hope they're not. So the people that I see out this morning, 
I'm praying that they're not sick. I'm praying that they're just on vacation. Or they just had a, a hard week and they're just taking it Sunday and they're checking us on Facebook Live. But if they are sick, I want us to, to lift them up in prayer this morning. So the people that you didn't see this morning that you normally see, take a moment while we worship. And I want you to lift up their needs like you're one of those four people. Like you're one of those four men and you're getting ready to dig through somebody else's roof for somebody else's miracle. And believe for God's very best. And this morning, that's what I want us to do as we worship God in this last song. I want you to be one of those four friends lifting up somebody else that needs community this morning, that needs a miracle this morning. Let's worship together.